we have been talking of renewal through building character, suggesting two key broad elements in particular as being essential to this process. The first, humility, because humility means that you are open to criticism, you are open to welcoming new perspectives, and you appreciate your limitations and recognize there is a power beyond us. The second element has been internalizing attachment to higher purposes. Today, I want to add a third critical player in our individual and ultimately national and universal character building. And that is hope. Now, before I say more, I want us to look at two ancient texts, one from the Talmud and one from the Torah, so that it opens us up to this discussion and we see support for my claim of how essential hope is. So I will share with you. So the first, again, it happened that Rabban Gamliel, Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria, Rabbi Joshua and Rabbi Akiva went up to Jerusalem. When they reached Mount Scopus, they tore their garments. When they reached the Temple Mount, they saw a fox emerging from the place of the Holy of Holies. The others started weeping, but Rabbi Akiva laughed, said they to him, why are you laughing? Said he to them, why are you weeping? Said they to him, a place so holy that it is said of it, the stranger that approaches it shall die, and now foxes traverse it, and we shouldn't weep? Said Akiva to them, that is why I laugh, for it is written, I shall have bear witness for me, faithful witnesses, Uriah the priest and Scharia the son of Jeberechiah. Now, what is the connection between Uriah and Zechariya? Uriah was in the time of the first temple, which we know was destroyed, and Zechariya was in the time of the second temple, which we know was also destroyed. But the Torah makes Zechariah's prophecy dependent upon Uriah's prophecy. With Uriah, it is written, therefore, because of you, you sinners of the Israelites, Zion shall be plowed as a field, destroyed. With Zechariah, later it is written, old men and women shall yet sit in the streets of Jerusalem. A beautiful prophecy. As long, Akiva goes on, as long as Uriah's prophecy had not been fulfilled, I feared that Zechariah's prophecy may not be fulfilled either. But now that Uriah's prophecy has been fulfilled, it is certain that Zechariah's prophecy will be fulfilled. With these words, they replied to him, Akiva, you have consoled us. Akiva, you have consoled us. Akiva, who always believed in a future, no matter how old he was, believed he yet could learn. He believed that he could go away and come back to a home and to teach. 
and he believed that even though his very rich father-in-law would not support them, that they would succeed, he and his wife, Rachel. This is an attitude that is so telling, that says so much, that we know that we get through these difficult times. And he had to see that happen, and then he is positive that the positive will happen. A story from the Talmud. We can obviously apply this to so many situations in life. The second is a story that you're all familiar with from Sefer Shmot. A man of the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw him that he was good, she hid him for three months. So, who is the man and who is the daughter of Levi? Who are we talking about here? The next pasuk, number two, should give it away. Moses. Sorry? I'm thinking of Moses. Yes, the child that has to be hidden is Moses. So the parents, a man of the house is Amram, and the daughter of Levi is Yocheved. But there's something perplexing here. What do we know about Moshe's family? He has not one, but two older siblings. So what does this first pasuk say to us? It sounds as if a man is marrying for the first time a woman. But we know that's not true. That's not true. He's already been married to her. So what is going on here? Is anybody familiar with how the commentators explain this wording? Anyone? Well, a beautiful Midrash tells us that when Miriam heard that her parents were separating, she became very active in their relationship. So you remember Paro, Pharaoh decrees all the boys will be killed. And so Amram and Yochevet separated, not wanting to have another child. Miriam, their daughter, comes and says, what are you doing? Maybe Paro's decree will come true, but if you do what you're doing now and separate from each other, for sure it's going to come true. And we're told that because of Miriam, Amram from the house of Levi went and took Yochevet again. Now, why does it not say their names? Well, if you look in the Hebrew, Vayelech Ish, and Yochevet is called Isha. Very often in the Tanakh, when someone isn't named, or they're named, but then they're described as an Ish or an Isha, it is someone who has a prominent position in their community and is considered very, very important. Well, I don't think any of us can question how important Amram and Yochevid were, for they gave birth to Moshe Rabbeinu. So obviously, Miriam convinced them to also have hope. I want to ask you now, though, what is the difference between this story and the one in the Talmud? Yes. Anyone? Take a moment to just remind yourselves, this group is walking along with Akiva, 
And they have this discussion why they're laughing, why he's laughing, why they're crying. I found a book called, a great big mm -hmm. book called McEwen's Cameras. And I didn't know if he would be interested or not, or if he just wanted to leave. Yeah. Uh, please mute yourself, whoever that is. Okay, <laughs> so we have this story. I will. And now we have this story. Anybody? Maybe because you haven't been thinking about it as much as I have, it won't be that clear, but is there anybody? I'm just thinking that it might be that there was actually action on the part of Amram and Le and, uh, and Yocheved. You know, the, and the former one, they were talking about it and laughing, but here they've actually done some action to show their hopefulness. Beautiful, Bev. That is the difference. And I'm purposely calling hope as opposed to optimism. I don't know if anyone, if I had initially asked to explain the difference, whether you would have. Before I started doing the reading I was, I'm not sure that I would have. I'm not sure. But let's see what Rob Jonathan Sachs has to say about this. So first of all, before we read this paragraph, he does differentiate between hope and optimism. Optimism, he says, is believing that the world, believing that the world is changing for the better. Hope, on the other hand, is active as Bev just said. It's the belief, Sachs says, that together we can make the world better. And the problem or the danger, he says, with pure optimism is that you might let it slide into complacency. Hope requires far more courage than optimism, the passive virtue. And he goes on to say, human beings are the only life form capable of using the future tense. Only beings who can imagine the world other than it is are capable of freedom. And if we are free, the future is open, dependent on us. We can know the beginning of our story, but not the end. That is why, as he is about to take the Israelites from slavery to freedom, God tells Moses, that his name is Eheyeh Asher Eheyeh, a very strange name. I will be what I will be. Remember he says, what should I tell him when he asked who sent me? I will be what I will be. Judaism, the religion of freedom, is faith in the future tense. And we could sit here all night going through examples of how hopeful we have always been. One more story from our sages, Chachamenu Zikronam Livracha. It's from a Midrash and Rashi also discusses it. According to commentary, some people when B'nai Israel left Egypt and were about to cross Yam Suf, some people wanted to surrender and go back to Egypt. Some were ready to commit suicide. Some were willing to fight the Egyptians. And another group started to pray. Moses cried out to God and God replied, in essence, stop praying and journey forth. Do something, do something. It was at that point that the famous 
Nachshon ben Aminadav moved into the sea. And when the water reached his nostrils, the sea began to part. Now, how do you react to Nachshon? Is he insane? Is he irrational or grounded? Can we imagine ourselves, if not in that exact situation, taking steps like Nachshon did, knowing that that is what one has to do in a certain situation? Think for a moment, even if you don't wish to share, but if you'd like to share, or if you'd like to critique Nachshon, remember, I'm only seeing a few wonderful faces, um, but unmute yourself if you have something valuable to say. Okay? And who knows if Nachshon believed that he would have taken that step if you had asked him a day before. I think we all rise to occasions that we would never expect we would have. Some are very personal and some are for our people, our community. And in those moments, we probably aren't thinking rationally, but that's where our gut comes into play. Sometimes playing by the gut can be dangerous. We know that. On the other hand, being too rational, certain things would not get done. It's, it's a dialectic that's difficult. That's difficult. Well, I'd like us to move on to contemporary times and two interesting personalities um, that reflect this hopefulness, but in a different way than our religious sources. So first of all, Shaul Chernikovsky, Russian born, was a physician and a Hebrew poet, born in 1875, and he died in Yerushalayim in 1943. And he remained a physician in Tel Aviv, but also we know him as a writer and as a magnificent poet. Now, before we read two of his creations, we must read this review written by Sorek, who is a retired professor of uh, Hebrew and biblical literature. And he says of Shaul Chernichovsky, and I'm purposely reading this before we read the two poems, both of which I believe you'll be familiar with. Shaul Chernichovsky did not know the life of his fellow Jews of the ghettos. He was a free and unrestricted, often unconventional individual, and he was to sing Zion's song in a new idiom. His background had neither strict Jewish legalism nor adherence to Talmudic doctrine. His home was liberal and observed the ceremonials of Jewish tradition, investing them with beauty and richness. He dur mitzvah. Chernichovsky was the first great rebel in modern Hebrew literature. He abandoned those elements which could be marked peculiarly Jewish, and he sought secular and universal themes. His poems in praise of nature and of paganism called for a reevaluation of traditional Jewish values. Chernichovsky's attack on ritual piety was brutal. He saw religion in all of nature, 
in all of God's creation, not only in prayer books and repetitive ritual. Now, I don't know how many of you remember, let me digress for a moment, though it's not really digressing. A few weeks ago, when we read a section in the uh, Talmud from Pirkei Avot, when somebody is studying and he takes a break as he's outside and observes a beautiful tree and he's criticized for having done that, Rabbi Cook says, no, what's critical or what's wrong is the fact that he felt when he looked at that tree that that was not a holy act. So here we have Chernichovsky. Yes, he was not davening and he was not studying Torah, but he's being brutal when he is showing such appreciation for God's creation. And was he not reflecting something that we have said and what we're saying every day since the beginning of Elul when we say, when we say that special psalm, till Shmini Atzeret, all that I ask is that I live in the house of God. Well, what is that house? It is not just a synagogue. It is not just a Beit Midrash, but it's the entire world. That's what we should be feeling. So for him, Chernichovsky, to be attacked because he was considered somebody whose attack on ritual was brutal, well, I think you know what I feel about that. Sorek goes on and says, no poet of the period made a greater contribution to modern Hebrew literature by arousing the youth of Israel to an awareness of the beauties of nature. Chernichovsky's reverence for nature inspired the generation of the reborn state of Israel. Remember, we're talking about renewal on individual and national and universal levels. Inspire the generation of the reborn state of Israel to create new hymns of glory to the landscape, to the face of the Jewish nation from the top of snow-capped Mount Hermon in the north, to the barrenness of the southern Negev. He is the Father God image who proclaims the sanctity of heaven and earth. How can one criticize that? His poems of universal love, peace, friendship is an expression of hope and faith. And are those not Jewish values? Well, so the problems we have today in the dichotomies between earth and heaven still exist. Now, let's take a look. You might be more familiar with the title in the Hebrew. Saki Saki. And Shaul Chernichovsky writes the following. I believe, laugh at all my dreams, my dearest, laugh and I repeat anew that I still believe in mankind as I still believe in you. For my soul is not yet unsold to the golden calf of scorn. And I still believe in man and the spirit in him born. By the passion of his spirit shall his ancient bonds be shed. Let the soul be given freedom. Let the body have its bread. Laugh, for I believe in friendship, and in one I still believe. One whose heart shall beat with my heart, and with mine rejoice and grieve. Let the time be dark with hatred. I believe in years beyond. Love at last shall bind the peoples in an everlasting bond. In that day, 
shall my own people rooted in its soil arise, shake the yoke from off its shoulders and the darkness from its eyes. Life and love and strength and action in their heart and blood shall beat and their hopes shall be both heaven and the earth beneath their feet. Then a new song shall be lifted to the young, the free, the brave, and the wreath to crown the singer shall be gathered from my grave. A rather special message and certainly hopeful. But Chernichovsky does something very important with his next piece. Omrim Yeshna Aretz. They say there is a land. Many of you heard this song in Beth Tikva on occasion. And he read this dreaming of our return to Israel. Some say it rings of tones of somewhere over the rainbow. I'm not going to read it in entirety, just the beginning and then the part that I think complements the previous poem. They say there is a land, a sun-drenched land. Where is that land? Where is that sun? They say there is a land. Its pillars are seven, seven planets springing up on every hill. Where is that land? Where are the stars of that hill? Who will guide us there? Who will tell me the way? And then he goes down. The land where shall come to pass what every man has hoped for. Everyone who enters will meet Akiva. Hello to you, Akiva. Hello to you, Rabbi. Where are the holy people? Where are the Maccabees? Akiva answers him. The rabbi answers him. All of the nation of Israel is holy. You are the Maccabee. They say there is a land, a sun-drenched land. Where is that land? Where is that sun? What Chernichovsky has done here is said that for us to acquire this land and to live in this land, we have to be active. We don't just stay at the stage of dreaming and having a vision. And what he does is, <laughs> he turns to our Tanakh and our Talmud and mentions characters, live characters. Akiva, the Maccabees. And these are people who gave us hope and a future. You know, Hanukkah is going to be here before we know it. But just one line about that. People will quickly say that the miracle of Hanukkah was that the oil lasted. I think the far more serious is that the Maccabees were like Nachshon and had the courage to go into that temple and clean it up and clean it up. The second person I'd like us to look at in a moment. Now, what are we looking at here? Anybody? It's a note, 50 shekels. And the picture, anybody want to take a guess? Shaul Chernichovsky. We know that famous people, important people are put on currency. Just to make this a little juicy. September 26th two days from now, but going back to 2014. There's a headline in the newspaper. Chernichovsky sparks currency row. Why? 
his Chagi ben Artsy, who is Bibi Netanyahu's brother-in-law, a well-respected educator, he called for the boycott of this bill featuring Shaul Chernachovsky. He said, it's an outrage, and he was supported by others, those same others who are calling for Bate Knesset to be open. He said, how can Chernachovsky be representative of the state of Israel? I have to ask, can anybody take a guess why? It certainly isn't because of its poetry. Anybody want to take a wild guess? And I'm only doing this to give us a, uh, can't just enjoy. Shaul Chernachovsky had married a religious Christian. Now, I'm not going to say anything about that. Just to say that as we said weeks and weeks ago, life is very complicated. I just read what Sorek so beautifully said about the contribution that Chernachovsky made and the hope that he gave us and young Sabra's and he quoted the Tanakh and the Talmud. But then, look what he did. What would you decide? I just leave that up in the air as we proceed. Now, this bill has not been questioned. And we are going to talk about the woman on this 20 shekel bill. Rachel Hamishoreret, Rachel the Poetess. She too was born in Imperial Russia in 1890 and moved to Israel in 1909. It's actually, you should take the time to look it up and to read her entire biography. Um, incredible. She moved in 1909 when she was 19 to Israel and she loved farming and went to the north and loved the Kinneret. But a woman who had much to do with farming asked her to go to Europe to become a specialist. She didn't really want to, but she did. Now, unfortunately, Rachel was not the healthiest of people and she became ill there. And because of the war, she couldn't come back and she finally did and she went back to kibbutz de Ganya where she was living but she was kicked out that's saying it very coarsely because it turned out she had tuberculosis and for fear of children contracting it she had to leave and they really hated the fact that she did and so she moved away and she died very young in 1931. And she wrote for us firstly this, because she always lamented that she was not able to give more than she did. I have not sung to you, my land, psalms of high praise or glorified you with a hero's deeds, only with a tree planted by the Jordan's banks, only with a path trod through your fields. How little, mother, that has been. I know how small your daughter's gift. Just a cry of joy when dawn broke over you, just for your poverty, a tear of grief. Now,
here on this earth, not in some cloud land, no. Like Chernikovsky, she's going to be realistic now. Here on this mothering earth that is near, with its sorrows and joys, however threadbare, that comfort us so, not in some missed time, now with what is at hand, with this warm, fleeting, palpable day, this day that is seizable only today here in our land. Come, come all who can before night's knell. Can it be for a thousand arms too much to roll with one last rallying push the stone from the mouth of the well? Now, the last line is alluding to the story of Jacob and Rachel when she is by the well and she can't move it and the other shepherds are not moving it, but then Jacob comes to move it and she's pleading, now we have to act, now. So you who already hear, now is the time. Now, I wanna make something uh, clear in case anybody is wondering. I am not bringing these selections regarding Israel for the sake of talking about Israel, though that would be fine. But it's the element that I said earlier of renewal, yes, of the land, but that part of that comes with attaching yourself to something beyond yourself. And that is what I believe Chernochovsky and Rachel did with their lives. I want to share this with you. Hillel Halkin is most known for his translation of Hebrew novels. He's written a couple of books as well. And he says the following. But before I do that, I have an image of him in a post office in Yerushalayim many, many years ago. His father would read Torah for the Minyan at the conservative synagogue on Agron for many, many years. This is just an aside. And um, his father, eventually, at a very, very ripe old age, developed Alzheimer's. And um, at that post office, Halkin was asked, where was your father on Thursday morning? And he said, to be honest, I forgot to go to pick him up. Now, his father, was suffering from Alzheimer's, was close to 100, and he read Torah every Shabbat and every Monday and Thursday. That's all he remembered. We've heard stories like that. This is this Hillel Halkin. And he says about Rachel in this poem, Rachel is calling on her Hebrew readers in Palestine then to make a Herculean effort to, to do what? They are to do it now, here on this earth, not in some cloud land before night's knell, but what is it that they are to do? It is a call for action, this poem. It demands that something humanly fantastical take place without the aid of utopian fantasies, with plain ordinary means, with what is at hand. Here, now, today. What was Rachel thinking of? Perhaps simply this. I'm Rachel. I'm at the well. I can't wait for all the shepherds to gather. 
If you who are already here in the land of Israel live this moment with all the intensity and solidarity that you can, you may yet accomplish something extraordinary before I, before all of us die. To be so hopeful and to write this when she had no reason to be hopeful. I'd like to spend the next few minutes and close our discussion over these last few weeks with two texts that for me capture the essence of hope. One urges us to express our appreciation daily, to wake up every morning. We discussed Modani, but to start our day with that attitude that as soon as I wake up, I'm aware that I should be appreciative. Appreciation for our abilities. And the second text that we are to concretize our abilities and dreams. So one of my favorite tefillot, and not just on a regular weekday, and not just Shabbat, but even on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, is the Birchot HaShachar. The one-liners that we say Baruch atah Adonai l'melchalam, asher natan l'sefvi v'ina l'avchin b'en yon u'v'en layla. Thank you, God, for giving us the ability to distinguish between night and day. Baruch atah, thank you for enabling us to get dressed. Who gives sight to the blind. Who gives us the ability to walk. Who made me a Jew. And we say these lines. Now, originally, these were not in the Sidur. They were meant to be said as soon as you woke up and after you washed your hands and so that when you opened your eyes, you said, thank you for letting me open my eyes. When you got dressed, you said, thank you for clothing the naked. Eventually though, this became a part of Shachri. It still has the same meaning but I kind of like, but we're all in such a rush to get wherever we have to. Not today. <laughs> anyway, so, so I'd like you to listen to what Rabbi Dahlia Marks, this is a woman who has a PhD in liturgy and her ordination is from Hebrew Union College where she teaches in Yerushalayim. And this is what she said. The blessings over actions recreate a physically complete person capable of hearing, seeing, and voluntarily using their limbs, able to rise from their bed, dress, walk, and provide for their household. They also recreate the awakening person as a Jew. In reciting the morning ritual, the awakening person confirms and ratifies both his, her physical and spiritual existence. By reciting blessings to the creator who created the world through speech. Remember, if you go back to Genesis, you'll see, and he said, humans symbolically recreate themselves anew each morning and reenact the divine process of creation. Now, in that bold sentence, bolded sentence, she's saying so much of what we have tried to assert over this series. At the same time that we are humble enough 
to be standing and talking before God and turning to each other. We also have to remember what we said in Modani, how it ends, that God has faith in us. Now, it's not just enough that God has faith in us. We have to really believe that. I think I shared with you, there are some people who at the same time that they say all the al khaits, they read a list of positive things that they've done. Because if you get yourself too down, you'll be paralyzed. So we have to know how to balance. But this idea of recreating ourselves anew each morning by speaking, that is confirming what we said, that we are meant to be partners with God. It's hard to think on that level regularly. But if ever there was a time to, people should be thinking like this instead of just being in denial of what they're doing. That's the first element. We have to stay alive. We have to stay alive. And we have to remember that we are in God's hands, but God is interested in our active hands. And that's why I discussed the beauty of Nitzilat Yadayim in the morning, not the one associated with bread, but that I am doing as the Kohanim did in the Beit Mikdash, getting ready for holy work, that that's how I look upon my hands. What purposeful, important thing am I going to do today? And if ever there was a list of things that we look forward to doing was one that was compiled by Naomi Shemer, and if you'd like to do the folk dance led by Marilyn Cohen, um, please do. Odloa hafti die. And so as I read this, either there are things on this list that we want to concretize or you hope for the next generation. Have in your mind what we're going to someday be able to do. And that's how we have to constructively enter Shabbat Shuva and Yom Kippur. As she's saying, I haven't yet loved enough. With these hands, I've yet to build a village. I've yet to find water in the middle of the desert. I've yet to draw a flower. I've yet to find how the way will guide me and where will I go. I, 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 I haven't yet loved enough. The sun and the wind blowing in my face. I, I haven't yet said enough. And if not, if not right now, then when? I've yet to plant grass. I've yet to build a city. I've yet to find that vaccine. I'm sorry. I've yet to plant a vineyard on all the hilltops. I've yet to do something with my bare hands. I haven't tried everything. I haven't yet loved enough. I, I haven't yet loved enough. I've yet to form a clan. I've yet to write a song. It hadn't snowed yet during the harvest. I've yet to write down my memories. I've yet to build my dream house. I, I haven't yet loved enough. And even though you're here and you're so beautiful, from you I run away like I'd run from a plague. There are plenty of other things I've wanted to do. You'd probably forgive me again this year. This is quite a list. Add to it, make sure it happens, or at least be hopeful that it will. Would anybody care to say a hopeful word as we draw to a close?
anyone, please. Nothing is trite. I'd like to thank you for giving us some hope, Bracha. It was truly inspiring. And um, I hope that you'll be with us more in the future. Thank you, Linda. I wasn't looking for thank yous, but I always appreciate that. I want you to know that you've given me something very special by me being able to do this with you. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Anyone else? So is everybody looking forward to Yom Kippur? Your rabbi gave a marvelous sermon on the second day of Yontif. That's marvelous. Uh, I'll, I'll, bracha, talking, yes, about, talk, talking about hope. So this, this is the Jerusalem, not the Jerusalem Post, the, the National Post in Toronto. I'm I remember of, it, yes. It could be, could be the Jerusalem Post, okay? Because here's a picture of Netanyahu, Netanyahu Trump, and, and the Middle Eastern guys. And one headline of one, one article is, Israeli peace deals great news for Muslims. And the other one says, Accords promise to break Mideast deadlock. Is that good news or isn't it good news? I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I think that we agree that it's not bad. <laughs> a lot of people have said that they can't expect anybody to be too joyous because people are normal here and are more concerned now about the health situation. Yes. <laughs> but it does give us hope. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank mm -hmm. you, Stan. You always share a good word. Anybody else? So my hope is that we are able to travel to Israel sooner rather than later. Amen. That's, that's well, my I hope we're all Amen. here because so many of us are in Greece at the moment. What? <laughs> <laughs> in Greece. <laughs> it's like Greece from Greece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, Gamar Fighting My Turba. Gamar Fighting My Turba. Gamar Fighting My Turba. Gamar Fighting My Turba. Be healthy and safe. Yes, Amen. 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 We'll look forward to studying with you some more over, over the, the coming months, I hope. Thank you, Marlene. I feel the same way. Take care. You too. Take care, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Bracha. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, off we go.